This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Support for MPB comes from Trustmark, committed to assisting businesses impaired by COVID-19. Trustmark is now providing small business loans through the Paycheck Protection Program. More information at trustmark.com slash PPP. Member FDIC. From MPB Think Radio, this is Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson, President of New Perspectives, and Ryder Tav, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives. Nancy and Ryder are both chartered financial analysts. Ryder holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. Some publicly traded shares of stock cost more than $300,000 for a single share. It is possible to buy part of a share, though, starting at $5 worth of a stock. Today, we'll learn about types of stock and ways you can invest in them. And our financial advisors are always available to answer your other personal finance questions as well. Contact us by email. The address, money at mpbonline.org. Good morning, Nancy. Uh, let's start with you. We have a new president in office. Uh, what uh, did the financial markets have to say about that? Well, so far, we've uh, seen some nice increases since the election, uh, significant increases in the market. It bounces back and forth from day to day, but there are two big positives in the short run that come with this administration. And the first is the vaccine. And so as the vaccine is rolled out, as more people get uh, the vaccine, we will naturally start to see people coming out of their houses. I have had a lot of people say they were going to run screaming out of their houses. And um, that's economic activity. So that will naturally push and be positive for the economy and for the stock market. And the other thing that's a positive in the short run with this new administration is a push for another stimulus package. So additional fiscal stimulus will then lead to increased economic activity and improvements in the stock market. Longer term, we are watching for any changes in tax policy. So uh, when we have uh, sort of big events or trends, is it just speculation as that the market is respe- responding to this event or that event? Well, sometimes it can be. And so when you see changes from one day to the next, for instance, if we see, um, oh, there was uh, Merck released information saying, my goodness, our vaccine trials are not working out, that could be a negative impact that day. But we look at a longer term trend on that. And the longer term trend is quite positive right now. Uh, And also, uh, the Senate approved uh, Janet Yellen for Treasury Secretary. Um, What work does the Treasury Secretary do that sort of affects us on a personal finance level? Well, I'm very excited about Janet Yellen being the the first uh, woman to hold that position. She was the first woman to hold the position as the chair of the Federal Reserve. As Treasury, she is really the government's banker. And so she's managing uh, revenues, expenses, the debt that we're dealing with. And she should be intricately involved with any stimulus package and pushing that forward. Good morning, Ryder. What financial news uh, would you like to share with us today? Good morning. Uh, I have been watching uh, with uh, a lot of interest and a very interesting market dynamics story, and I'm going to make it a little more interesting than that sounds. Uh, So one of the things that's been happening recently is um, a company called GameStop. Uh, You know, they, you know, it's a very small store in a lot of malls. They sell video games they sell used games Mm -hmm. um obviously not a lot of people going to malls uh lately so they had not been doing well and it came out that uh, there was you know there are a lot of companies there are a lot of investment companies hedge funds who were betting um that this company would go out of business and so it was it was kind of on the brink of 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 death uh in some ways um but a, a group of folks online uh, discovered that this was the most heavily shorted stock in the market, and they just decided they were going to um, they were going to start buying it. And if the price starts rising and you are betting that it will fall, you have to, you know, you got to make a decision. You're either going to put up more money or you're going to buy your shares back. And so that ca- creates a phenomenon known as a short squeeze. 
when there are just a, a huge number of people who have to buy the stock. And so the price skyrockets. So that's what was happening in GameStop um, over the past couple of days. And uh, it went from being a $5 stock to, uh, I want to say yesterday, it maybe hit $100. But uh, that went rather quickly, and it, it hit actually $150, $160 yesterday uh, from being five dollars, from being a couple dollars uh, months ago. And so this actually, um, one of the hedge funds who had been betting against it, uh, they have had to get some emergency financing. Uh, so it is a very interesting uh, story battling out between uh, just retail buyers online and uh, and the the hedge fund uh, folks who, who think they know everything. Well, uh, GameStop happens to be one of my favorite places because I'm a big video gamer. Um, and I know that they're uh, the one store in the metro area, uh, last time my friend and I went in there, they were selling the fixtures in the store itself and there was very little uh, left in fact there was one video game used video game that was 99 cents and it was 60 percent off i didn't have enough change to get it or i would have even if i didn't like the game itself oh. um but uh, so i mean is this would this change the future of the of the of the company or is it just sort of stock games going on by people who can do that uh, it generally does not change the future of the company. Uh, one instance in which it can, um, so this, a similar thing happened with Hertz, the car rental company, uh, back in March or April of last year. It actually declared bankruptcy. Um, and for some reason, people were still buying the company. So the share price was still going up, uh, even though they were in bankruptcy. So they did sell some shares while they were bankrupt, with approval from a bankruptcy judge, sell some shares, which they said in the filing would be worthless. Um, they sold some shares to help finance the bankruptcy, to help pay some of the lenders back, uh, things like that. It didn't really change the future of the company, but it gave them a, a little more breathing room to do, do a few things. With something like this, unless they were actually, uh, it's, it's just because it's happened so quickly, it's unlikely that the company was able to capitalize on it. Um, you know, maybe for some executives who, who happened to just still have uh, shares left, maybe who had some who had some stock options, maybe they got lucky and, and sold some today and are going to enjoy a better retirement than they were planning. Um, but by and large, you know, if the company was going bankrupt, it's not because the stock price wasn't good. It's because the business wasn't good. Well, that the other interesting thing was uh, for Christmas, I brought my brother who's also a gamer a couple of used uh, video games and so i was at the store and when we got in there the the guy the manager came up and said i you know i not, not there's not everything out there i thought he meant that there was additional uh, games in the back that weren't on display but what actually happened was when i brought the box to get the disc for the game to buy it he basically said the company tells him that they can't sell it at the retail location and so i had to actually make both purchases of the games online which i thought was rather odd and it was to me portending towards they were trying to get rid of the brick and mortar and move more towards uh the online presence but again i think shortly thereafter we found out the bad news and uh i, I know that one of the area uh, metro area ones was staying open but like i said another one uh, was definitely uh, closing and, and like I said, selling everything, even the fixtures, you know, the the racks, mm -hmm. everything. It was, uh, it was everything must go, Kevin. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, when we talk about things, we always try to start out, you know, pretty basically. So tell us and remind us what exactly is a stock. Well, I'll start by uh, addressing what Ryder was talking about with GameStop, and sometimes that happens with stocks where there's speculation, short-term trading, and yeah, you can make money like that, but to be an investor, you have to consider that owning a share of stock is owning a piece of a company, and if you're going to be an owner of a company, you're going to pay attention to how does the company make money? Are they making money? How are they handling their debt? Who is managing the company? All the things that you would look at if you want to be an owner of a company to determine whether you're going to make money off of it, that's what it's about. Uh, do you buy stock directly from the company you're interested in? 
No, not typically. You only do that when there is what we call an initial public offering, an IPO. But most of the trading in stocks happens on the secondary market. So you're buying and selling among other investors. So that's always a caution. Whenever you're buying a stock convinced it's going to go up, you're buying it from somebody who else who's equally convinced it's going to go down. All right. So, Ryder, what about uh, an exchange? What is that? So an exchange like the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, which is the National Association of Securities Dealership Automated Quote System, I believe is that what that's what that stands for. Um, that is that is where the companies are listed. That is where people go to meet to make the trades. You know, uh, it started the New York Stock Exchange started as a group of brokers standing under a tree, a buttonwood tree, I believe. And uh, they would just meet there, you know, they would trade stocks, you know, they all had customers and, you know, one customer wants to buy Ford Motor Company and one customer wants to sell it. So they meet together and they, you know, they make the trade happen. Uh, it was probably mostly train companies back then. Um, so that that's what the exchange is. And obviously now there are thousands of companies, there are millions of people trading. Uh, the members of the exchange are large national brokerages and they are uh, some companies that are called market makers who they don't all they do is is buy and sell stocks to facilitate the trades that other people are trying to make. Um, so that's kind of how it happens and how an individual would do it. You would just open a brokerage account. You know, we've talked about this a lot. Um, you know, we use a discount broker, uh, TD Ameritrade. They're a large national brokerage. They offer, you know, online service for the most part you know they offer good enough service they're not doing all of the hand holding that a full service broker might might do all the more complicated trades that, that a more full service broker might do but there are tons of brokers um you can open up an account with and they will go place the trade for you they'll either do it on exchange directly themselves uh, they will have that stock in their inventory or they will work with a company who can make that trade so the broker is the middleman between the person wanting to invest and the company they're wanting to invest in Yes, or uh, or the broker can simply buy the stock from another broker. They again, typically, they're not buying from the company themselves. Like Nancy said, in the secondary market, it's all just if you are buying the stock, then someone else is selling it. And it's generally not the company who is buying and selling their own stock. They're they're too busy off running the company. What's one way you can keep up with the news from the New York Stock Exchange? We'll have that for you next. You're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. The information presented on Money Talks is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information presented does not create any type of relationship between the hosts and guests and the listening audience. Please consult a financial advisor or any other qualified professional for guidance about your personal finance questions. You 
are listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Our website, moneytalks.mpbonline.org, is one way to hear past Money Talks broadcasts. You can also download the MPB Public Media app and listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand to all the local MPB Think Radio shows. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson, president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taff, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. To see banners unfurled and hear bells ringing, follow at NYSE on Twitter to keep up with the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, so, Ryder, I know that you and Nancy often talk with our producer, Liz Gill, about things that we'll talk about on this show, and you brought to Liz's attention the ability to buy part of a share of stock. Uh, when was this made as an option for investors? Uh, yes, yeah, so the kind of iteration that we're going to talk about a little more is a much newer thing. Um, we've talked about the brokerage uh, slash app, uh, phone app called Robinhood, uh, which is really focused on kind of retail customers who didn't even have a, uh, a brokerage account before, not necessarily, you know, it's not, they're not focused on the most wealthy, most sophisticated uh, clients. Um, but they, they, they've, they had a lot of good innovations, and one of them was allowing people to buy just, you know, a few dollars of a stock. And, you know, we have people on, you know, on the show kind of say, oh, you know, I needed to buy this stock. It was only – oh, this stock was only a couple dollars, so that's the one that I could afford. I could afford a smaller, a smaller dollar stock, uh, things like that. Um, so that's been an option – I don't know, maybe a year or so. Uh, now a lot of other brokerages, Charles Schwab and Fidelity, I know, also offer this fractional share trading where you can buy just a few dollars of a stock at a time. Um, where have these slices of shares come from in the past? So in the past, uh, we saw fractional shares as dividend reinvestments. So uh, classically, a one way to buy companies is you know you go directly to the transfer agent and you send them a check and you say I would like to buy, you know X number of dollars, X number of shares, and what they do is they can either send you if the if the company pays a dividend, so a quarterly dividend, you know part of the profits of the company. Um, they distribute that to the shareholders. They can either send that to you as a check or they can reinvest that for you. And that means buying more shares with it. And so, you know, previously, you know, say you bought 10 shares of Intergy Company and then they had a dividend uh, and you reinvested it, maybe you would have 10 and a half shares of, of that company. And so, and so you would accrue more and more shares. And over the long term, it's just a way to add to your return a little bit. Again, if you believe in the company for the long term and you reinvest those shares, then you you know you keep getting more and more shares, and you end up with more shares worth more money in the future. So, Nancy, this is one new method of investing. How often do new methods of investing come along? Oh, it happens all the time. Uh, we just see changes in how we invest, um, and those come along two trends uh, or two areas, let's put it that way. One is in retirement because most people own stocks through some sort of retirement plan, a 401k, a 403b. And then the other area where we see changes is among uh, smaller investors, younger investors who will latch on to some of these new things. I'll back up a little bit beyond just um, to, from 2000 back to 1993. One of the biggest changes was the introduction of the first exchange Exchange traded fund ETFs and we've talked about those on this show before but um, those have just exploded and now the big issue is how do we get more of those ETFs into retirement plans as an option and what Ryder is talking about with these um, partial shares would allow ETFs to be offered within those plans so Nancy can you think of any examples of a, a new coke trend that uh, didn't catch on in investing something that was maybe not uh, not very successful well um gosh what hasn't been successful i mean they, they try all insurance. kinds of things portfolio insurance okay yeah um <laughs> uh, frankly, not only was that we, not successful but that was a massive failure i believe that sounds just uh, what, like new coke <laughs> I mean, lesson, there were lessons learned from that, I believe. And I mean, you know, new methods devised. But, you know, that was a, a, an, an innovative uh, product of some sort that did not work out. 
Nancy, anything else come to mind? Well, I was just going to say a lot of the ones I see get introduced are uh, successful simply because they're marketed in such a way that uh, investors think they're getting a really good deal. And I see that more on the insurance side with these specialized annuities, and they are pushed to clients or investors in such a way they think that's just um, a great deal and jump on board and don't realize what they're getting into. So, Ryder, we've mentioned on the show Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Class A. It's on the New York Stock Exchange's BRK.A. It trades at $348,500 as of yesterday. So that would seem to be a good stock to buy a partial share of if you wanted to add this to your portfolio. Are some other stocks in that sort of range that might be a good way to get this uh, slices of? So I will say there are none in that range. Uh, that is significant. But there are some very popular stocks that are very expensive. Um, Amazon, one of the most expensive stocks, is $3,300. So if you wanted to buy some Amazon and you only had $3,200, you're out of luck. You can't buy a whole share. But now with the fractional shares, you can buy a whole share. Um, or if you had $6,000 and you wanted to buy two shares, can't quite get to um, another, you know, Google uh, Chipotle, the uh, the burrito restaurant uh, trades for almost fifteen hundred uh, Shopify, which powers a lot of online retailers, trades at twelve hundred dollars. AutoZone, uh, almost twelve hundred dollars. So all of those are not only if you only had a thousand dollars to buy, you couldn't buy a whole share. But even if you were putting together a bigger portfolio, because I would never recommend someone just put all of your money in a single stock. Um, so maybe you're maybe you have ten thousand dollars, you know, not an insignificant amount, and you're making a larger portfolio. You still might not be able to buy one share of some of these and keep it in a diversified portfolio. Uh, so that's what this fractional share trading opens up. And I will say, um, Kevin, that a lot of people I talk to think that the price per share is how you measure whether something is expensive or cheap as far as stocks are concerned. And it's not. That really doesn't have anything to do with the value of the whole company. It's just the price of that share, that piece of the company. And you really need to back up and look at other measures, you know, price to earnings, uh, price to sales, price to book, um, that really then lets you know whether something is expensive or cheap. So, Ryder, can you buy any stock in this fractional manner? Can you buy a slice of any stock, or is that something that the I'm, I'm, well, let me just put it that way. <laughs> well, um, kind of, not really. So, for, firstly, buying a, a fractional share of a stock, it's really just an accounting problem that a few brokerages have decided to address or solve. You're not actually, you know, when you buy a share of a stock, you get to vote a single share. With a fractional share, you don't get a half a vote. Um, it's it's just the, the brokerage is is makes it look like you own half a share for all intents and purposes. You know, that value goes up and down um, and you can trade it. But that is effectively you're just kind of selling it back and forth with them. Um, so it, it's it's not. So it does depend on the brokerage. Um, the couple I've mentioned, Robinhood, I believe, allows you to do fractional shares of pretty much anything. Uh, Fidelity allows you to do fractional shares of pretty much anything. Charles Schwab is pretty. They're they're the ones who have um, marketed this a lot, uh, and they have a pretty good interface for doing it. They allow you to buy anything on the S and P 500. So they're taking a little more conservative approach to it. Because whenever someone is going to buy a fractional share of something, the broker has to take a little risk because the uh, the whole share has is out there somewhere in the universe, and they have to take the risk of of that the rest of that uh, share going up or down. But they could sell off other other sh parts of that sh uh, share. Absolutely. You know, if they had two people who come to them and say, hey, we each want half a share of Walmart, well, great. You know, the broker just has to buy a share of Walmart and just kind of designates this 
you get one half and you get one half. Um, you know, if they get 10 people who want a third of a share, you know, you know, it doesn't really matter. They, they don't have to take a huge amount of risk, but that is kind of how it works is, is they're just taking a little bit of that stock price risk, uh, while the customer is, is, is buying the rest of it. We're discussing how to invest in stocks today. What are some tips for investing in your 50s? We'll have that for you next. This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. is MPB Think Radio's personal finance broadcast. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge anderson president of New Perspectives and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. They're both chartered financial analysts. Ryder holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. A recent tweet from the NASDAQ was investing in your 50s. They give tips on their social media post from the account at NASDAQ, N-A-S-D-A-Q. So, Nancy, when we're talking about buying these slices of stocks, uh, does this make record-keeping a little bit more challenging? Well, it should be just the same. Uh, you always have to think of when you buy a stock, what did you pay for it? That is your cost basis. So even if you only bought part of a share, you still have to track how much did I pay for that part of a share. And then when you sell it, the difference between what you sold it for and what you paid for it, that's going to be your capital gain or your capital loss. And you have to be careful if you sell it before you've owned it a full year and there is a gain, you're going to be taxed at your income tax rate versus waiting until after the 12 months when you'd be taxed at a lower capital gains rate. Uh, what other information do you about stocks do we need to keep up with? Well, uh, if you have dividends, so if you have a stock that pays dividends, that will be taxed at the dividend tax rate, and those will re be reported every year. Most stocks pay dividends by the quarter, and uh, you will then receive tax information at the end of the year on that. Uh, and then as uh, an investor, I guess uh, you can uh, as uh, you can either get the dividend as like a check or something, or you can just maybe ask to have it sort of rolled back into like if you have a mutual fund? Well, you can have it rolled back in to buy more shares. And that's where it can get a little bit more complicated with your record keeping. If you get those dividends in cash and put them in your pocket, that's easy. Your cost basis on those uh, remaining shares would stay the same. But if you buy more shares with that dividend, you have to track that dividend as being reinvested. That is added then to your cost basis. So there's a little bit of extra accounting there. Uh, so, Ryder, one phrase we've heard and we mentioned a little bit earlier in the show, the initial public offering, and that's when a, a company first offers a stock. Can anyone get in on those? So, no. Um, IPOs, initial public offerings, essentially the a, a company needs to raise money. Uh, maybe they're, it's their first time raising money. Maybe a lot of the early investors, while the company was still private, they're ready to get out of the company, you know, move on with their lives. Uh, so they approach a bank who has a lot of customers, and they say to the bank, you know, we need to sell some shares. We would like cash for these shares. You've got a lot of customers. They've got cash. They want these shares. Let's make it happen. 
happen. Um, so the bank sells to those customers. And, and so one, you have to be a customer of the bank. You know, nowadays, there are more banks involved. It is a lot easier. You may find that, you know, if you work for, if you have a brokerage account, your broker may be able to give you some shares. But generally, you know, especially if these are in high demand, not everybody's going to be able to get some. So the next day, once they've kind of sold those, the next day is when it trades for the first time. And what happens the first day it trades, uh, the market has an auction for those shares. So the people who bought it in the IPO, the people who, who agreed you know, through their bank, through their brokerage to give the company some money in exchange for shares, not all of them are selling. Um, a lot of them have bought it and they're they're good to go. They want to keep it for a long time. Um, so few people are selling. So you often see the price rise somewhat dramatically um, on the first day of trading because there's still a lot of people out there who weren't the bank's customers who want to buy the stock, but there's just not a lot of shares going around. So they keep having to bid higher and higher to get those shares. And that's why you see a big a big pop on the IPO day usually. So that's the IPO bump. Yes, that's yeah, IPO bump or IPO pop, and um, and and you know, for some companies, you know, it it bumps up a, a couple percent, and 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 companies kind of like to see that as well. It would be really embarrassing if you know they sold their stock and it only ever went down. Um, you know, some people get a little upset and say, "Oh, they could have priced their shares higher. They could have gotten more money for their shares." Oh, that maybe they could have, maybe they couldn't have. Um, just the dynamics, uh, the supply and demand dynamics are weird. Uh, some, especially recently, IPOs. I think the average IPO doubled on the first day of trading, which is that's quite a lot, and that just reflects the fact that there is a lot of demand for these stocks outside of the brokerages, and there's just not. When, when the brokerage customers who bought it initially are not trading it or not selling it, there's not a lot of shares to go around. So high demand, low supply, price is going to go up a lot. And Kevin, we know most of that bump happens before lunchtime. Um, and then the caution we always tell people is most IPOs a year later are trading at below their initial price. Hmm. Uh, that's because more stock becomes available for people to purchase? Or reality sets in. <laughs> <laughs> well, w one way in which more stock comes available is a lot of the company insiders as part of the IPO. This is something that's traditionally done in IPOs. It's not required. It's not necessarily. It doesn't happen in all of them. A lot of the company insiders, they promise, and a lot of the co people and some of the larger investors who purchase large amounts of shares to, you know, again, they're they're giving the company a lot of money for this. Um, they they sign lockup agreements. They agree not to sell the shares for a certain amount of time. Um, so you know, particularly with startup companies, you might have a lot of employees or a lot of executives with a lot of shares, and they're told they they cannot share, share, sell those shares for a certain number of months, maybe three to six months. And so when they can sell those shares, you know, look, employees need money. They've got to buy houses. They've got things to do. Uh, they want to spend money. Uh, they want to diversify their portfolio. But when they do, that's an additional amount of supply coming to the market. And that can cause the, um, the, the price to decline as well. Um, is there anything a company can do if the reaction to an initial public offering isn't as robust as they were anticipating? Well, sometimes they can um, they can stop it uh, because know that they're not going to move forward unless they are already seeing demand. They are already doing presentations to big bank customers to make sure that there is the demand at the price that they're putting out there. So they have a pretty good idea before it officially goes public. This is go ahead, Brenner. Yeah, the, the whole process of IPOing, like Nancy said, it involves a lot of a lot long run up of, of the company, enticing and getting people excited about their company. So if they don't see the demand there, they can stop it at any time. Now, once they have sold the shares to the bank or the the brokerage's customers, I mean that's pretty much it. You know, you you can't you can't really pull it at that point. Once it's on the market, it's on the market. This and Kevin, a fun fun little thing is that the run-up as they do all these presentations to get ready to offer these shares, um, they call those beauty pageants. <laughs> 
<laughs> that that makes sense. You're trying to you're trying to dress up the put the lipstick on the pig, I guess, right? You said that, <laughs> not I. <laughs> Uh, we have an email here. Nancy, maybe you can take a stab at this one. It says, I inherited some S-Corp stock, and now I receive a K-1 report annually. What are the advantages of S-Corp stock, and what should I look for on the K-1 to see if the company is doing well? Well, an S-Corporation, uh, public companies are going to be C-Corporations. This tells me this is a private company. It's not traded on an exchange. You cannot easily just go out there and sell your shares. Um, the K-1 is just a document that shows based on your percentage ownership, this is your percentage of the income this year that you have to declare on your taxes. S corporations are what we call pass-through entities, meaning every company as they list their net income at the bottom on uh, line at the end of the year, all of that then goes out to each of the owners based on their percentage share, and then they pay taxes on that at that time. So um, S corporations, yes, you have something, but it's not very liquid. We're talking about stocks today. If you want to follow an amusing financial Twitter account, we've got a suggestion for you. That's coming up next. You're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Contractor ever tell you of the price of something and it sounds so high you think eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101 podcast everywhere. Thanks for listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. You might not want to take their financial advice, but you can get some amusement from at Stock Cats on Twitter. Nancy, their plans for initial public offerings in 2021 from companies our listeners may have heard of before. Uh, what will be available to buy shares of that you know about? Well, this is just mutterings of who plans to go public. Uh, Robinhood, Nextdoor, Instacart, you can imagine we've all been using that, Petco. And the more companies that then follow through with their plans to become public, that's actually a good economic sign because they're not going to do that unless they can get top dollar for their shares. Um, any ones that you've heard of that might be going public? Um, no, I don't pay a lot of attention to who's actually teeing up uh, because there's always so much hype around all of that. And I prefer to wait until after they become public and I have a good long track record to look at. All right. Looks like we have um, some more questions here. Um, Ryder, what's the difference between a stock market and a stock exchange? Oh, um, interesting philosophical question. Uh, the exchange is an actual place, uh, be that physically, like the New York Stock Exchange actually has a stock floor where uh, brokers go to meet, uh, or, or kind of a space um, in, uh, in our imagination. It's on, on the internet. Uh, you know, uh, the NASDAQ has been from the beginning uh, an electronic exchange, you know, so the physical location is like, I believe it's Weehawk in New Jersey is where they keep all their servers. Uh, so it can be a physical, it's a, it's a, but it's a physical thing. It is where the trades take place. The stock market is more of just a broad term term to talk about all of these exchanges, all of the all of the trades which can happen, and that can be 
at exchanges, that can be over the counter, uh, that can be broker to broker, that can be just in between a broker um, or a dealer, you know, that can be in between a, a customer and their broker. You know, it's it's more of um, it's more of just a term of art for all of the all of these transactions going on. That is that forms the market. Uh, Nancy, before we leave the IPO, and I guess the reason a company would do that was it's a way to raise capital. Right, and capital, of course, is just another word for money. And I always tell anyone who's interested in an IPO, the first question you ask is, well, what are they going to do with this money? And you need to delve into the prospectus, which is the document that they put out saying, here, this is how much money we're trying to raise, and these are our plans for it. And if you think those are worthy plans, then, yeah, you would join in because you think this is a company that's going to grow, they're going to take my money, and they're going to use it to really grow this company and return to me more money than I gave them. Um, but often you'll see this idea of going public is really more like, as Ryder mentioned, mentioned earlier, cashing out. And I'm not so sure I want to participate in somebody who's just cashing out because, you know, they're giving up ownership. If they're giving up ownership, that means they don't think they're going to see as much growth going forward as they did in the past. So I want to be very cautious about that. We've got a call on the line, so let's uh, say good morning to Fletch, who's called in from Tupelo. Fletch, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. Good morning, uh, Ryder. I got a, a question for you, but uh, but something else uh, came up while I was thinking on hold. Um, do y'all mention much or say much about the Chicago Board of Trade? Uh, no, we have not uh, addressed that yet. Um, um, but you know, do you have a question about them or, or more of a comment? Well, no, not really. I heard a little bit earlier than I've been out out of the car for a minute, um, so I didn't know if y'all had mentioned anything. Um, but. Um, I don't know if y'all would be aware. There's a guy who's probably late 50s now from Inverness, a Brumfield, that was very uh, instrumental in taking that to an electronic uh, trade market, if I recall the stories correctly, um, and was very instrumental in kind of upgrading, as I understand, that, that market to the electronic trading a uh, number of years ago, probably 10 or 15 years ago, if you know much about that system. Mm -hmm. uh, but that had a big Mississippi influence there. Didn't know if y'all knew that. That's pretty yeah. cool. Well, that's going to be mostly commodities. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Chicago, that makes is, you know, their, their kind of pedigree has always been uh, commodities uh, trading, obviously, you know, you know, uh, capital of the Midwest, you know, all of the, all of the grains, all the, all the livestock, all of that. So that's why they have um, futures trading is there, uh, a lot of options trading, actually, and uh, kind of any, any, any commodities like that. Another interesting one, another Mississippi connection was, um, for uh, we're talking about uh, high speed traders this this was a very popular topic a number of years ago but essentially whoever can you know everyone is kind of getting information faster and faster these days so you know if you want to if you want to beat someone else to the market you just have to have a faster connection and so the company that actually laid the first fiber optic cable directly from new york to chicago uh, to to connect the uh, new york stock exchange with the chicago exchanges there's a bunch of exchanges in new york a bunch of exchanges in chicago that was a mississippi-based company um but apparently uh six months or a year after they did it, somebody built a faster connection by using uh, radio towers. So, you know, uh, your success is, uh, and your speed is fleeting. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm not sure if he was involved in any of that or not. Um, could have been. Um, so earlier you talked about the guys shorting uh, GameStop, and uh, I was intrigued and infuriated reading the big short. Um I still don't completely understand all of that subprime stuff. Uh, I kind of understand, but not fully the way you described um, mm -hmm. GameStop action. I take it uh, you don't care for people who try to, I guess, exploit an opportunity to make money in the demise of another group. 
You know, there's a difference between, and, and, and games, you know, I don't know, uh, you, you know, it's, some of this will always kind of be a mystery because we just, we just can't know what an alternate uh, future would have been, but, you know, with, with GameStop, for instance, um, you know, you have a company that is failing, you know, when you have a company, you can look at it and you can say, I think that stock is going up or I think that stock is going down. And neither of those decisions or, you know, if you want to call it a bet, neither of those is a, a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, I think that stock is going up or down. What happens, the weird dynamics happen when maybe a whole bunch of people suddenly think that the stock is going up, when a lot of people think the stock is going up, them buying that stock will cause the stock to go up. And likewise, when a whole bunch of people think the stock is going down, that will cause the stock to go down. So I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I think one way you could see it as a bad thing is if that company, uh, say if GameStop was a viable company, but they just needed a little bit better access to the capital markets. You know, maybe they just needed one more loan. If there was nobody to give them that loan, they would fail. If they just needed um, to issue a few more shares to get enough money to kind of make it. And if, if, if people selling, people betting against the company was preventing them from doing that, then it would, that would be a case where people betting on the stock did change the fortunes of the company. I, I don't know that that's what's happening in the game stock, stop example. Again, most of the time, if a company fails, it's because the business wasn't good. It's not because of their stock price. Right. Um, and I think, so I think, a, um, there was a it, difference. Are they actually buying a stock? Go ahead, Nancy. Uh, I was just going to say there's a difference between what happened in the subprime market uh, when he talked about the book, The Short, The Big Short, um, because that was not all transparent. What we're talking about with GameStop, that's all happening in the public markets. It's mm -hmm. all transparent. All the Everybody knows what's going on. Okay. And that means, you know, I, I have, I'm neutral on, on either side of that. Um, it will wash out as long as we can all see what's going on. What happened prior to 2008 was all hidden because it wasn't regulated. Um, it was, there were a lot of people trading, and they didn't know what the, the other side was going on. And that's where we got into trouble. Good deal. Thank you. Thanks for your call, Fletch. You know, you uh, uh, the future of the business, and just my limited thing, Ryder, I would think part of what GameStop's trouble was that they, they were selling, you know, the physical games when the trend in some of gaming is uh, to go towards downloading the, the game to your console and playing, uh, you know, that way. I know that, that uh, Xbox 5, I mean, the uh, PS5, there's one version that is has no hard drive, so the only way you can play games is to get, you know, the, it downloaded to your machine. So I think that might have had something to do with, with the future of, uh, of GameStop for sure. Right. And, and, you know, you can sell as many shares as you want. You can go take out as many loans as you want. But if your business, if you can't money, make money doing your business, that's going to dry up sooner or later. Uh, and, you know, so, again, I, you know, it's 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 not a big value. I don't have a big value judgment on, on, on that sort of thing, kind of like Nancy said. And I would, to me, an example of a company that uh, sort of read the tea leaves properly would be, you know, Netflix. I, I was a member of Netflix back in the day when we, again, you would get, you know, a DVD sent to your house so that you could watch movies. And they certainly have successfully made the, a transition from that to, you know, being, yes. a, being a content producer. Absolutely. And one, actually, the, Netflix is a really good counterexample to GameStop here because Netflix recently announced um, they have been kind of burning through cash for a long time. They recently announced they didn't have to keep selling shares anymore, but they're a successful company now. All right, that's it for today. Money Talks is a production of MPB Think Radio, funded in part by generous financial support from listeners like you. To hear today's show or previous show, visit moneytalks.mpbonline.org or listen to the podcast by searching for Money Talks on your preferred podcasting app. Our show is produced by Liz Gill, and our call screener today was Java Chapman. For Dr. Nancy Lottridge Anderson and Ryder Taff, I'm Kevin Farrell. Join us every Tuesday at 9 for Money Talks, heard only on MPB Think Radio.
Support for MPB comes from Trustmark, committed to assisting businesses impaired by COVID-19. Trustmark is now providing small business loans through the Paycheck Protection Program. More information at trustmark.com slash PPP. Member FDIC. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. 